You know how sometimes you're just sitting there, maybe staring at a particularly stubborn stain on the ceiling, and your mind wanders to the truly important questions? Like, what if you gathered every single nuclear weapon on Earth, all 13,000-ish of them, from the suitcase-sized tactical nukes to the accidentally created a second sun category? And then, for reasons known only to a very specific kind of mad scientist, you carefully lowered them, one by one, into the deepest, darkest part of our planet the Mariana Trench. Now, your first guess might be that this would go very badly. Maybe the ocean boils away. Maybe a single monstrous tsunami bursts out of the Pacific like Poseidon doing a cannonball. Maybe the Earth tilts slightly and we all spend the next few years trying to fix our calendars. That's fair. But reality, as always, is more complicated and weirder. Let's start with the firepower. The combined yield of all the world's nukes is somewhere between 6,000 and 7,000 megatons. That's millions of kilotons. For comparison, Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. So this is like detonating the Hiroshima bomb every 10 seconds for the next three years, all at once. If we did this on land, we'd get a fireball larger than a city, a shockwave that would flatten forests hundreds of miles out, and a mushroom cloud that could probably be seen from orbit but we're not on land. We're 11 kilometers underwater. That's 1,100 times atmospheric pressure. That's like trying to inflate a balloon inside a concrete parking garage full of elephants sitting on every surface. When a nuclear weapon goes off underwater, it creates a superheated plasma bubble that expands outward until it meets all the water. Water, being extremely dense and incompressible, basically says no to all of that. The result is a violent, shuddering pulse. The bubble expands, collapses, rebounds, collapses again like a very angry jellyfish doing push-ups. This is the bubble pulse effect. And with 13,000 bombs, the first few pulses would obliterate everything in the immediate area. Submarines, fish, ancient deep-sea crustaceans, vaporized. But the energy has nowhere to go quickly. Instead of a mushroom cloud rising to the heavens, the water takes the brunt, heating up, compressing, and launching shockwaves. Those shockwaves do not create one neat tsunami. They create dozens of overlapping waves, some canceling, some amplifying, bouncing off continents and recombining in unexpected places. The result is a chaotic wave field, a confused mess of water deciding whether to gently lap at a coast or completely remove Portugal. Now, let's talk about pressure. Nuclear bombs rely on expanding gases to do damage. But at trench depth pressures, it's like trying to scream inside a steel vault filled with molasses. You'll make noise, but no one's impressed. A lot of the energy gets eaten by the ocean. Sure, we'd see tsunami waves, big ones, but not wipes out the world big. More like terrifies shipping companies and becomes a Wikipedia page big. However, water vapor is a different story. The heat would instantly vaporize millions of tons of water, shooting a column of steam and radioactive particles straight up. Like a soda bottle rocket, but the soda is glowing and extremely angry. This plume would punch a hole through the ocean surface and into the atmosphere, carrying with it radioactive isotopes like cesium-137, iodine-131, and someone's very bad life choices. A mushroom cloud would form, not made of dust and fire, but of boiling seawater and whatever used to be the trench. And then it starts to rain, specifically radioactive rain. As the water vapor cools and condenses, it falls back down across the Pacific and beyond. Tiny radioactive particles hitch a ride in the clouds, sprinkling themselves across oceans, forests, cities, tourists in Hawaii, and probably at least one international climate summit. Speaking of climate, vaporizing that much water injects a ridiculous amount of water vapor, a greenhouse gas, into the stratosphere. You might get a short-term cooling effect from debris blocking sunlight, a nuclear winter light, but in the long run, the water vapor would trap heat, a lot of it. Basically, Earth becomes a microwave burrito, and we are the filling. Meanwhile, under the sea, the seafloor is having a nervous breakdown. 
The Mariana Trench sits near a subduction zone, a place where tectonic plates grind together over millions of years. Setting off thousands of nukes there is like shouting it to a tectonic therapy session. It won't flip a plate, but it might. You could trigger earthquakes, possibly even tsunamis in entirely different oceans. The planet, it turns out, does not like being poked with 13,000 radioactive spears all at once. And the trench itself? Still there, but wider, angrier, sterilized. The unique ecosystems which evolved in darkness over tens of millions of years are erased. It's like bleaching a rainforest with fire, only wetter. Oh, and remember those radioactive materials? The ones in the bombs themselves? They don't just disappear. Some will bond with seawater and settle as a nice glowing layer of regret across the Pacific floor. Future geologists will call it the oh no layer. The total long-term environmental impact? Enormous. Earth shrugs, coastlines suffer, and humanity once again realizes that nuclear weapons are not toys and the ocean is not a trash can. So if you ever find yourself with a few thousand nuclear warheads, a submarine, and a free afternoon, maybe consider a different science project? Like building a potato battery or trying to toast bread using lightning. At least then, when everything goes wrong, the worst you'll do is overcook a sandwich. Because in the grand story of Earth, dropping every nuke into the Mariana Trench isn't the end of the world. It's just the beginning of a very awkward conversation with the fish.